What's up you guys, Rex here. Let's talk about how medical students actually pay for medical school. I did a video last week breaking down all of the costs to attend a private four-year medical school like I attend at Duke University in the United States. Click on the card or check the link down below if you haven't seen that video. In short, the total cost to attend a private medical school like Duke for four years is about $371,000 if you are paying cash for it. Just as a comparison, a public school like UNC would cost more like $280,000 for four years. In that video, I talked about how it actually can cost a lot more than that if you have to borrow 100% of the cost of attendance in student loans. Thankfully, for the vast majority of students, people are not borrowing 100% of their cost of attendance. However, a very real 11.1% of graduates from medical school in 2020 graduated with over $300,000 in medical school debt, so they might have been having to borrow 100% of the cost of attendance. Now, most of this information is coming directly from the AMC. I will link down below. This comes from their graduating student questionnaire. But since we already have started talking about it, obviously loans are a big part for a ton of students. The median amount of medical school debt for graduating medical students is about $200,000. However, this doesn't capture the whole story because a full 29.9% of medical students graduate with zero debt whatsoever. We will talk about how that might be possible later. But for the 70% of students taking out loans, generally there are two types of loans. There are federal loans and private loans. Now those federal loans can be further broken up into direct unsubsidized loans for which students can take out $20,500 per year. Those usually have a slightly lower interest rate than direct plus loans for which you're only limited by the cost of attendance of your school. So people will often take out the first $20,500 in the federal direct unsubsidized loans and then any remaining difference they have to make up to pay for their schooling and living expenses, they will borrow in direct plus loans. Now these loans have a lot of advantages as far as there's a ton of flexibility in deferment for residency and grace periods, and there are a variety of different repayment plans that can be short or extended. And there are also plans like pay, repay, and IBR, which allow you to pay in an income-based fashion. Now, private loans are sometimes better for certain individuals that sometimes they have a slightly lower interest rate if you have a really good credit score. Sally Mae would be a classic example of private medical school loans, and they typically will also loan out up to the full cost of attendance. And sometimes they also do grace periods and deferment during residency. So just because you aren't doing federal loans doesn't mean you won't ever have those options. Now, the next big category is scholarships and grants. These can both be merit-based or need-based. And a good chunk of medical students either receive merit or need-based scholarships or grants. For 2020 graduates, that was about 62.8%. So let's first talk about merit scholarships. This, I imagine, is the vast minority. I would imagine the vast majority of these scholarships and grants that make up the 62.8% are need-based. But merit scholarships very much do exist. Some of them are open to any people applying to a medical school. Some are only open to certain races or backgrounds, etc. But they do exist. And people also wonder, do actually like full rides and full tuition scholarships exist? Yes, they are very rare and very competitive and typically exist at the more competitive schools, but I do know full rides exist for a fact at at least like UCLA and NYU. Full tuition scholarships that don't cover living expenses like a full ride are slightly more common. I know that Penn gives out like 30 a year. I know UNC gives out full scholarships. Now, based on the data, only 2.5% of graduating medical students reported receiving over $300,000 in scholarships or grants. And only another 3.9% reported receiving between 200 and 300,000. Now, I don't know exactly how much that 2.5% over 300,000 and 3.9% between two and 300,000 is factoring in people receiving outside scholarships. Now, there are a lot of outside scholarships that are smaller, $10,000, $20,000, but the big ones that people think of for outside scholarships that allow you to pay for medical school full ride are the MSTP program for people who are getting their MD, PhD, which represents a little over 2% of medical students. And then there's also another about 2% of medical students who are getting their medical school totally paid for with all of their living expenses by an armed forces scholarship as part of the health profession scholarship program. So if that about 4% of students is factored into that 2.5 over 300,000 and 3.9 between two and 300,000, then there's a very much a small minority of students actually receiving those like full ride scholarships, either that are merit-based 
or need-based. So let's talk about need-based. Need-based scholarships are typically only relevant at your really big name private schools as far as I know. But if you are lucky enough to get accepted into some of those top tier schools like Duke, Wash U, Johns Hopkins, Stanford, I believe all of those schools do give out a significant amount of need-based grant aid to a vast majority of their students. And there are generally two different styles of need-based aid that are given out. The first is where they give you a percentage of your estimated need. So that's how Duke works. So an example would be the school calculates that you have an expected family contribution of let's say $30,000. So their cost of attendance is about $90,000. They take away that $30,000 left with $60,000 in need that you have. And they will give you need-based aid up to a certain percentage. For Duke, that's about 58%. So you might get like $35,000 in grant aid from your school that is need-based if you are in that sort of situation. Now, the other sort of strategy is that everybody gets as much grant aid as they can until everybody has the same amount of need. And so I believe this is how Johns Hopkins operates. So that might work where they say, all right, everybody is going to have to graduate with $20,000 in loans or $40,000 in loans. I don't know what that number is. So let's say it's $20,000. In the case where you have an expected family contribution of $30,000, they would take your cost of attendance, maybe like 90,000, subtract the 30,000. So now you have 60,000 left and they say, okay, you will only have to graduate with $20,000 in loans and we will give you whatever that difference is in your estimated needs. They would give you $40,000 in grant aid just to make sure everybody graduates with the same amount. Now, if you're in a situation where your expected family contribution is $90,000, no matter what system you're going to, you would get absolutely nothing. But I know both Duke and Johns Hopkins report that about 85% of their students receive some amount of need-based grants. Now, the final way that people are paying for medical school is cash flowing it in some way. This could be cash from themselves working a job in medical school. I don't know a single medical student that works a traditional job, so that's probably not it. It could be that they've taken a few gap years and they were able to save up money or were investing money in undergrad, something like that. They might have savings themselves. It could be that they are married and have a spouse who's able to pay for a significant portion of their medical schooling. Probably the most significant is coming from parents, whether their parents have money saved up, saved up in a special 529 account specifically for education, or their parents just have extra income that they're able to help out and be very generous and help their students by paying for part of their educational expenses. Now, I imagine that last category is the biggest explanation of how 29.9% .9 of medical students in 2020 graduated with zero debt whatsoever, but I wanna go more in depth in that in its own video, so look forward to a video where I talk about trying to explain how nearly a third of medical students graduate with zero debt. In the meantime, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, leave them down below. I'll read and respond to every single comment. If you want to check out more videos specifically about getting into medical school, check out the playlist on the right. If you want to make sure you don't miss my future uploads, make sure you subscribe, hit the notification bell. As always, like the video if you like the video, dislike the video if you dislike the video. And until next time, don't be ordinary, go be great.